Um, so it's, it's been great being here. I've, I, I've really enjoyed this session so far. I, I actually learned a lot. I don't, I'm not a, I don't do PRS as much, um, so, or sorry, PGS as much, and that goes in my slides too. I, I call them PRS, polygenic risk scores. I think you guys uh, aren't dealing with binary outcomes so much, so it makes sense that they're PG, PGSs in yours. So just substitute PGS wherever you see PRS here. But it's been uh, really interesting so far. It's been a great session this morning. So um, hopefully I can keep that up. So uh, just a quick outline. Uh, I'll talk about the uh, definition of G by E and the motivation for studying them. Uh, some basic, two kind of basic types of G by E. And that is uh, talking about this on the additive scale versus on the multiplicative scale. Um, it's really about the way that we think about uh, how to, uh, what, what, the y, what the outcome variable is, what scale the out, outcome variable is on. Um, some examples of notation and issues of scale and how interactions can be dependent on the scale upon which y is measured. And then some statistical models uh, discussing um, what those different terms in an interaction mean. Um, then uh, how to properly control for covariates, which is surprisingly not om almost never done correctly in this field. And then um, finally, issues with candidate gene by E findings. I should have a final bullet point here, which is uh, how to do them, wh how I think they should be done. So, okay, so G by E uh, definition. So we can think of the effect of a risk allele uh, depending on the level of the environment. So. Um, the effect of the APOE4 gene might depend on the amount of carbohydrate intake, and this is a finding in the literature, whether it's true or not is uh, debatable, but that the effect of that E4 allele depends on the amount of carbohydrates you have. So if you have a lot of carbohydrates and you have E4, it's particularly bad. You know, few, few carbohydrates, E4 isn't, isn't so bad. Um, equivalently, you can think about the effect of the environment. In this case, it would be the effect of carbohydrate intake depends on the variant that you have, the genetic variant that you have, whether you have APOE4, E3. If you have E4, maybe the effect of the environment matters a lot. Carbon intake matters a lot. E3, it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much. Your risk is about the same. So in either case, we'd call that a gene by environment interaction. And so the motivation for studying these, I think, are sound. Um, you know, genes don't affect traits in a vacuum. Uh, their effects must at some level uh, depend on the environment they, fi they find themselves in. If you think about genes for smoking, I mean, those genes are obviously going to have a different effect in an environment where it's very difficult to obtain tobacco or where tobacco use is illicit than they do in an environment where the environment is replete with, with tobacco and the ability to obtain it. Um, so understanding how environmental factors modify genetic effects is the study of G by E. And in my in my view, you know, these gene by environment effects are probably ubiquitous. I think they probably occur all the time. Um, I think the, the real issue is, 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 whether, is how to go about studying that and, and really whether the effects that have been found and reported to date in the literature are true or not. And I'll be talking about that a lot. Um, I mean, if you think about, um, if, that's all right. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, if you think about, if you define, uh, you know, for a, a given outcome, it's reaction to the environment, right? You define the outcome rather than the outcome itself. You define the outcome as, as how much carbohydrates matter to risk of, of, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, that itself, it would be amazing if that trait wasn't heritable. And so the degree that reactions to the environment are heritable, um, and almost all complex traits are, then you're saying that it's probably likely that G by E effects exist all the time. So I think it's probably likely that, that G by E effects exist. Um, so, and also, you know, another motivator for a lot of people is that this, the study of G by E is appealing um, because it, I think it counters misinterpretations of, of behavior genetics research being about genetic determinism. And I think it also um, suggests uh, actionable ways that genetic risk could potentially be modified. Um, but as I said a second ago, you know, the detection of, of G by E effects is, is not straightforward. There's a lot of uh, statistical pitfalls in their detection, which, several of which I'll, I'll cover here. And um, I think there's a concern 
certainly that, that I've expressed and others have expressed that the, the vast majority of, of G by E studies that have been reported are on a particular type of G by E, and this is a candidate gene by E study where we a priori choose a candidate gene polymorphism that we think is relevant, and a priori also choose an environmental risk factor that we think is relevant, and see if that candidate gene polymorphism is moderated by the effect of the environment. And there's a, a concern that that uh, particular approach has a very high false positive rate uh, that probably parallels the very high false positive rate of candidate gene uh, literature in general. Um, so I'll be, I'll be talking about that near the end of this uh, talk. Um, so I think you can break down G by E in two basic types. And I, I think it's important to keep these uh, somewhat distinct. And this is not something I've seen written about a lot in the literature. Um, so one of them is uh, what I call a quantitative, what not I call, I mean is called in the BG community, a quantitative G by E. This might better be thought of as a additive, a, a, a VG by E interaction, where the genetic variance is changing over the level of some moderator. So you might imagine that the heritability of IQ increases as SES goes up. And this is a finding that, that, uh, that's been reported uh, a lot in the literature, both um, uh, both being replicated mostly in U.S. samples and not replicated in European samples. Um, but this is what I would term a quantitative G by E. And the model for this, I mean, there's a lot of ways that you could parameterize it, but I've modeled it this way. Can people read this in the, in the back? I wasn't sure about the... Is it okay? Robbie, you can read that? Okay. So we can model this as Y as a function of, um, you know, the sum of this term here times the, the actual genes at each gene K, or the alleles at each allele uh, SNP K, um, plus the effect of the environment plus some error term. So if you break this down again, this is just, this right here could be thought of the breed as, as the breeding value, which is what the PGS is trying to estimate. This is kind of the total genetic score that somebody has for depression or for Alzheimer's disease. Um, times uh, one plus uh, some constant here, some beta constant, times the environmental moderator. So the, the point here is that that beta prime is the same for all the different genes that you have there. And this term is going to modify the genetic variance of Y. If you think about what the variance of Y is, it would be the, the variance of that breeding value plus the variance of the breeding value times beta squared, well, beta, beta prime squared times the variance of the PRS times the variance of E, if we assume that E and the PRS are independent. Um, times beta squared times the variance of E. So you'd see it by that. I maybe should have written that out. But, that, but this, this would uh, predict that the variance of Y is going to change depending on, on the level of E that you're in. Um, so some examples of this is uh, you know, twin studies. And I said this just a second ago. It appears that the additive genetic variance, that's how I um, term additive genetic variance, is VA. It's very common in, in the behavior genetics literature. So the, the VA for IQ, the out of genetic variance for IQ, is lower at, at uh, low SES and, and increases as SES goes up. This would be an example of a quantitative G by E. Um, in a PRS study, you might find that the R squared. Alternatively, you might find that the beta, if you're just thinking of it as a, as a Y, is, effect, is uh, you know, predicted by the PRS. The beta is higher, or the R squared is higher from a depression-based ba PRS uh, as a function of, tri of childhood trauma. So um, so the, the heritability for this PRS increases uh, as, as you get uh, high, more and more um, trauma. So this is a finding by Pyrut in the literature as well. It's another example of what you'd call a quantitative G by E. Qualitative G, G by E's are what I'm going to be focusing most on because it's where most of the attention in the literature is. Um, and this is that the genetic effects at different alleles are multiplied by a different, a different effect B prime K. Right? So each different SNP here is going to have a different B prime, potentially, um, at each locus across the levels of E. So here, it's really almost the same as this, except now we've got this B prime subscript K. So this allows for the potential for different alleles to have different effects. So in other words, uh, it, going back to that APOE example I given a second ago, it's possible that the E4 allele at... Um, you know, at a particular level of the environment has one effect and has a different effect at a different, different level in the environment. Um, if you think about this at a, at a polygenic level, 
right, across all the genes in the genome. What this really would be talking about is a, is a genetic correlation. It's going to reduce the genetic correlation between individuals at different levels of E. So if you think about two MZ twins at two different levels of the environment, they're going to have a lower correlation than two MZ twins would at the same level in the, of the environment, two monozygotic twins at the same level in the environment. So it reduces the genetic correlation to the degree that individuals are at different levels of the environment. Um, some uh, examples of this type of thing. So, so usually this is, is uh, modeled at particular loci. And um, so this is a very famous, probably the most famous G by E study. Uh, I think it's got like 7,000 citations or something like that. It's published in 2003 by Caspi et al. But that the effects of stressful life events on depression depend. And whenever you see this word depend, it usually is talking about an uh, interaction. So it depends on this moderator that depends on the 5-HTTLPR polymorphism that you have. And we'll, we're going to use this example a lot in the, in the talk. Um, you can also look at this, well, I should also, well, I'll get to this in the next slide, I guess. We can look at this genome-wide, too, using a, what's called a GWIS study, genome-wide interaction study. Um, you, uh, also, this, would, this is studied in uh, GRIML, um, which I'll be talking about not with respect to interactions, but I'll be talking about GRIML a lot tomorrow, um, such that what we're predicting is that the um, genetic correlation for, in this case, for you know, particular outcome is going to depend on the level of that environment that you're in. And so here, the level of environment that we looked at, this was a paper by DeCandy et al. in 2013, we looked at um, African descent versus European descent. So the, the moderator here is the ethnicity. And we were interested whether the genes that affect schizophrenia in Europeans, to what degree are those uh, overlapping the degree, the, the genes that affect schizophrenia in Caucasians. And we found uh, using um, G, G. Rimmel's G by E uh, test, and you can also, we also looked at this using just a genetic correlation. Um, we estimated that that genetic correlation was about 0.7. Um, in this context, by the way, that a genetic correlation is, is interpreted as um, the percentage of variants that are overlap between those two variants. It is not the square of that that would be the pr proportion of overlap. Um, you, can, you can do these types of studies as well with a PRS. So let's, let me just go through some of the different designs of um, G by E and what they, w whether they give you, a, can be testing a quantitative or a qualitative. Uh, G by E. So with twin studies, we can test uh, both types of interactions. The quantitative is uh, often done. This is like the Turkheimer study that I ta talked about with IQ being variants, the adagenic variants of IQ being a function of SES. You can also, also look at qualitative G by E. This is done a lot with uh, gender, for example. So uh, to what degree are the, the genes that affect height in females the same as the genes that affect height in males? That genetic correlation is, is very, very high. It's like 0.9, I think but there are some that are different. Um, but that's a qualitative G by E. Um, the next two here are looking at particular SNP by SNP effects. So for candidate genes, um, really the, the, the main focus in the literature has been on qualitative G by E. I think um, almost never is this a quantitative. And the reason is, is, is this little um, um, note that I have down here that's an A there. So um, for a single polymorphism, it's basically impossible to differentiate a quantitative versus a qualitative G by E. If you have a qualitative G by E, it implies that there is a quantitative G by E. And so it's not really of interest. People don't usually think of, uh, let's model the variance of Y, right? People are thinking about, let's model the mean of Y. And so, the, um, so it is the case, I guess, that all these different uh, qualitative G by E's that are done on a per SNP basis or a per polymorphism basis are actually also looking at a, uh, a quantitative G by E, but that's often not, usually not the focus. Um, a GWIS study is just a genome-wide interaction study. And here, rather than, th these aren't done a lot, but they are out there. And, and here, rather than um, just focusing on a particular polymorphism, we actually take that <coughs> model, uh, that, that interaction model, where we're going to model the effect of the environment, the effect of the particular polymorphism, or SNP, and the effect of the SNP times that environmental moderator for every SNP in the genome. Okay. And uh, once again, here the uh, focus is on a qualitative G by E and not a quantitative G by E. Um, we can think about a polygenic risk score, PRS, what I call it. It's the same exact thing as what you all have been um, talking about as a PGS. 
Um, so I'm sorry about the difference in notation here. Um, I have nobody to blame but myself for not sending the slides in early. <laughs> but anyway, so um, I think usually, but not always, this, you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of PRS work, but I think usually the, the uh, focus would be on whether the uh, quantitative G by E, whether the variances are, are, are different. Or, and I think that's the same thing as saying whether the uh, slope is the same for, uh, you know, for PRS or PGS in one level of environment than another, because obviously the slope is going to have, is, is intrinsically related to the, to the R squared. So I think a lot of people are, uh, talk about this in terms of, okay, this PRS explained, you know, 6% of the variance in depression in this group, but only 2% of the variance in, in depression in this target sample that were stratified by this environmental group. Well, it's the same thing as just doing a Y is equal to the PRS plus the environment plus PRS times the environment. Um, that's uh, pretty much algebraically equivalent. So, um, And finally, uh, G. Rimmel, which I'll be talking about tomorrow, like uh, GCTA. A lot of people are probably familiar with that software pack package. GCTA isn't the method. G. Rimmel is the, probably the better way of describing that method. Um, to date, that is only uh, inst instantiated in a qualitative G by E. Whether, I mean, the kind of simplistic way to think about this is whether the same genes uh, for at, at this level of the environment are, uh, that affect this trait are the same that affect this trait at this other level of the environment. Um, that's what a qualitative G, that's what the G by E term is uh, when it's modeled in GCTA. Um, there isn't to date uh, a way to uh, model a quantitative G by E in G Rimmel. There's a hidden option here. We've talked with Sean about this. And we've, uh, we looked at that and it's, it's unfortunately it's biased because they're making some assumptions that have to be made because they don't want to use nonlinear constraints in GCTA for good reasons because it slows it down a lot. And my postdoc thought, well, this is a very simple thing to solve. So we, we did that and that's, we're, gonna, we're working on that, that, getting that published now. Um, unfortunately, it does take quite a bit longer because it, it requires this, the use of nonlinear constraints in this. Um, but there will soon hopefully be a way in the literature to, to test quantitative G by E to see whether the actual SNP heritability changes across some level of E. Yeah? Are you at all saying one approach is better than another? Not at all. No, they're, just, they're, they're testing different hypotheses. One is about the, uh, the change in the genetic variance across the level of E. And the other one is about whether the effects themselves at, at each individual locus changes as a, as a function of E. They're just different. They're really different. They're different hypotheses that are being studied. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you can take genus data and, <clears throat> and maybe they haven't done it, but if there's a way that you could turn it into um, something more of the additive type, right? Well, you mean so to, to take a G whiz and, and do a PRS? Something like that, yeah. Basically, something like that. I don't know. I mean, that, I, wouldn't, wouldn't that be tough? I mean, you'd have to have the E. Oh, I guess if you have the E for each level, yeah, I guess that would in principle be, be doable. That's actually kind of interesting. So you've got the E variable, right? Carbohydrate intake for every person in your, in your target sample. And you've done the same thing with every person in your discovery. I mean, you can imagine there could be a lot of ways this could get mucked up, right? But I think in principle, it's, it's doable, yeah. What do you mean by lower liability? I, my understanding is not just oral, like, like, uh, uh, higher variance. Yep, that's, tr that's true. That's definitely true, yeah. So I wonder if that's what, meaning that, that might play a role in it being harder to do something like, like I was just saying, or if um, just the bigger samples. You, you're definitely going to need bigger samples, and that's kind of a recurrent theme here, is that the power for stu studying interactions is typically a lot lower, just as it is for any kind of higher order term that you're, you're testing. And so you're, the standard errors are going to be a lot larger, so you're going to have a lot more noise. My guess is that that PRS R squared is going to be not much better than just an additive PRS. I mean, certainly by adding another term, you should be explaining more variance, I would think. I don't know, actually. That, because you're adding a lot more noise. I don't know. This is something I haven't. 
Any other questions about this? I don't know, it's an interesting, interesting thought. No, I've never, I, I, I don't think it's ever been done in the literature to date, though. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to be focusing really on these qualitative G by E's uh, for, you know, both candidate gene and G was, or G whiz, uh, because of the most commonly done and they garner the most attention in the literature. And they're often done the very worst. So, um, <laughs> So, uh, and Dan, are we going to have time after this for like Q and A with yeah. the, yeah. with the, yes. Okay. So, and yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Okay. So I said this before. The most cited G by E paper, uh, Caspi et al. studied the effects of 5-HTTLPR on depression as a function of uh, childhood maltreatment. So they did this in the the uh, that's the sample that was discussed by Patrick a second ago. Um, the, the Dunedin sample from New Zealand. So uh, among 847 26-year-olds, so by the way, notice that that sample size is, is minuscule compared to what we need typically to find main effects, which right off the bat should kind of start ringing alarm bells that, wait a minute, this is typically underpowered. Now maybe the effect size compensates for that, um, but certainly if that's true, then, then G by E effects must be orders of magnitude larger than what we typically see for for main effects in, in gene studies. So, um, but among 847, 26-year-old, they found a marginally significant effect of 5-HTTLPR. This is a, do people know what this is, 5-HTTLPR? It's a, it's a, uh, yeah, it's in slick 6 a 4 gene. It's a particular polymorphism. It's about the number of repeats. So if you have a few <coughs> repeats versus a lot of repeats, and they kind of, there's kind of an arbitrary distinction, whether mm -hmm. they call it a short or a long, repeat polymorphism. So this, these, are, these repeat polymorphisms are, are different than SNP polymorphisms, but there's a lot of them out there, and they're not assayed on SNP chips. However, most of them can be predicted from SNP, so it's not likely that we're missing most of the variants that's contributed by these, but they're, they're often not as well tagged as other SNPs are. So, you know, whether we're, we're getting 80 or percent of the variants of these VNTRs or just 60%, I'm, I'm not sure, but we're, we should be get, getting most of the variants that's contributed by these in GWAS. Um, however, the effect varied, the effect of this 5-HTTLPR variant varied by stressful life events, and the probability of depression are as follows. Now, I've simplified this because obviously I'm, I'm leaving out the headers I get here, um, just to keep all the math simpler as we move forward. But among the, uh, the low-risk LL genotype, this is the long, long genotype homozygote, um, the effect of maltreatment, childhood maltreatment on depression is basically zilch, right? Um, among the short short, you can see among people who aren't maltreated, there's almost no effect of that 5-HTTLPR genotype, right? But there's a huge effect among the SS genotype for maltreatment. So the effect of maltreatment depends on whether you're LL, no effect, or SS, huge effect, whopping effect. Um, you could talk about this in terms of probabilities, like I did here. You could also talk about it in terms of relative risks. So we could use this as the baseline probability and divide each of these probabilities by that base baseline. This is called a relative risk now. So obviously, by definition, this relative risk is 1. This one is 1.03. This one is 1 because those two probabilities are the same. This one is 2.1. So in other words, you're at a 2.1-fold risk of developing depression if you have both maltreatment, childhood maltreatment, and the risk genotype. Um, so it seems as though the effect of this variant depend on maltreatment. You could equivalently say that the effect of maltreatment depends on the variant. And when one has both, um, the, depressive, uh, the risk of depression doubles. And that's an example of a, of a G by E. Um, so notation, I'll call G the genetic polymorphism, E the environmental moderator, Y the outcome. Here I'm going to be using um, binary outcomes. All the, everything that I'm talking about here applies equally if G is continuous, if E is continuous, and if Y is continuous, or any of those combinations therein. So none of what I'm talking about is specific to, to, this being, to these three being binary. Um, so for simplicity, I'm just assuming they're binary. I'm going to call E0 low risk, E1 high, high environmental risk, low risk gene, high risk gene, and let PGE be the probability that Y is 1. So for example, that we have a disease given G and E. So these are the different probabilities that I'm talking about here. <coughs>
Okay, so let's talk about the kind of two basic ways that we can model interactions on an additive scale or on a mul multiplicative scale. Um, so uh, if we think about what the at null hypothesis is for a purely additive scale, what this really is is about how we think about the joint effects of G and E together, right? Do we think about that on an additive way or do we think about it in a multiplicative way? So if it's an additive way, the excess risk of G by E under the null is just going to be the risk of the environment plus the risk of the gene, okay? If you take this risk and that risk and add them together, that should equal P11 under the null. In other words, uh, the effect of P11, which is P11 minus P00, right? That's the effect of getting both versus the effect of getting not, neither. That's this. That's the excess risk of G and E. Under the null should equal the effect of getting just the E. P1, oh, I'm sorry, let me go this way first. The effect of getting just the gene, P10 minus P00, plus the effect of getting just the E with G being zero, P1, P01 minus P, P00, right? So under the null, under an additive model, this risk is equal to that risk plus that risk, okay? I think this is a very simple way to think about uh, interactions. Uh, it's, it's often the way it's done when we're talking about continuous outcomes. Um, for binary outcomes, we often think about it in a multiplicative way, but I think it's crucial that people realize that when you just kind of go in and blindly start using logistic regression, you must realize that you've actually made a change to the, to the scale of Y, and it can fundamentally change the way that we think about interactions and change the, the statistical significance of those interactions. So on a multiplicative scale, it's different. Now we're talking about the excess risk of G and E is the effect of G times the effect of E. So we could think about the, the excess risk here on a risk ratio scale, right? It's the effect of P11 over P00. Right? That's the relative risk of having both risk factors. And that should be equal under the null to the relative risk of getting just the gene here. Right? That's the relative risk of just the gene and not the environment times the relative risk of getting just the environment and not the gene. Okay? So this is on a multiplicative scale. So it does change, and I'll, I'll go through several examples of, of, of how this works. Um, so here's an example of an interaction on an, an additive scale. And these, these are the numbers, again, from the CASPI finding. Um, so the interaction measures the extent to which the effect of the two fac factors combined. P, this is the effect of those two, P11 minus P00. That's the effect of both combined. Um, exceeds the sum of the individual effects, as I said just a second ago. So this is just P11 minus P00 minus... P10 minus P00 plus P01 minus P00, minus that entire part, okay? So this is it all written out, right? This, the, the effect of the excess risk of both together, minus the sum of the two risk alone, okay? And if you do that math, you, you cancel out terms, this is going to be equal just to the P11 plus P00 minus P01 minus P10. That is the extent to which you see an interaction on the additive scale. It's the extent to which the excess risk of G and E together differ from what you'd expect under an additive model. Okay? If we find that this effect, that term, is over zero, we say that the interaction is positive. Getting both together is worse than we would expect, than either one alone. And if you find that it's less than zero, then it's negative. Getting both together is not as bad as you'd expect from the two out of the terms together. Okay? So here, in this case, uh, we, we do, this, do this math, and you see that this effect is 0.33, or it's over zero. So in other words, the two risk factors combined have a larger effect than expected based on the sum of the G and E effects. Okay? So on an additive, additive scale. The same example on a multiplicative scale. So here we have the risk ratios. Uh, you can think about this just as just the, um, you know, the risk ratio here is that equal to the risk ratio here times the risk ratio there. So here the risk ratio is 2.1. This risk ratio obviously is one, and this ratio of risk is just barely over one. And so one times 
uh, is, not much, is, is not much different than one, which is gonna be quite a bit different than two, so we're gonna divide those two by each other. So here, if right under the null, we'd expect this to equal that, so we're gonna take the term on the right, divide it over here, and so we're gonna say the risk ratio of one, one divided by the product of those two risk ratios um, should be different than one to the degree that there's an interaction. So no longer zero is our baseline here, it's now one. And so in this case, it's just P11 times P00 divided by, th this is once again just math, you just do all this math out, then the P00 ends up coming up here, the numerator, uh, divided by the product of the two probabilities, these two probabilities. In this case, that's equal to 2.06. And here again, we see a positive interaction. Okay, if that interaction term is over one, we say it's a positive effect. The, the effect of both of them together is worse, is, is, is bigger. I guess worse is kind of a confusing term here um, because, yeah, anyway, so, because positive you think good. So I guess that's confusing. Positive in the sense that both of the risk factors together are, are bigger than you would expect based on either one alone. Um, so in this case, this is a case where the, the the multiplicative and the additive scales agree on the direction of the interaction. But that does not have to happen. And I'll give some examples of when that doesn't happen. So, you know, researchers routinely kind of say in the discussion sections that, oh, you know, interactions depend on the scale. Um, and so you have to always keep this in mind. Well, it's, a fun, it's really a fundamental issue that really shouldn't be just a hand wavy thing in the discussion. I think it's imperative that as a scientist, you really should be reporting these on both scales so that people understand that, okay, well, there is an interaction on this scale, but not on that scale, and that will change how we should think about this, as, uh, as I'll demonstrate in a second. Um, so, you know, the other thing, and I, I think I said this a second ago, less appreciated is the choice of the model. So it, if, whether you're using a logistic regression or just a, a, an ordinary least squares regression, will change, and, and also, obviously, whether you're taking the log of y, for example, or just y itself, implicitly changes the scale of y and can change evidence for an interaction. So here's an example, a, a kind of a toy example I came up with, where we have, in this case, right, you can see, right, just, just kind of eyeball it, that, that excess risk there is only about eight percentage points. This ex excess risk here is only about 13 percentage points. Eight plus 13 is gonna be less than 38 percentage points increase. So on an additive scale, we actually have a positive interaction here. Okay? But on the multiplicative scale, you get the reverse answer. Right? In this case, this is about five-fold worse. This is like, you know, seven-fold, over seven-fold worse. But that's only, you know, 20-fold worse. Okay? So, you know, five times seven is going to be bigger than 20. And so you see here, that is the case. Here we have actually a negative interaction. So the, sh the, the, the direction of the interaction and the way that we would talk about how G and E together combine, and if, and if we're talking about an additive scale, we're gonna say, oh, the effect of these together is bigger than we would have expected. If we're thinking on a multiplicative scale, we're thinking the effect of the risk gene and the environmental risk together are less bad than we would have expected or, or less powerful than we would have expected. So the choice of scale is fundamental to um, whether you, how you th think about these interactions. And, and of course, the, uh, this can happen in, in reverse. Here's an example where it is, it is reversed. And here on the additive scale, as it should be kind of obvious, this effect is negative. Having them together is not as bad as having, um, as what you'd expect based on the, on the additive effects of, of getting just E and getting just G. But on the multiplicative scale, that effect's actually stronger than we'd expect. So this is reversed of what we've seen here. Um, I, I should note these are kind of extreme examples, obviously. I mean, usually, but not always. Um, the direction of the interaction is the same. Um, but that isn't always the case. And, and also, if you think about it, um, if you have a case where you have exactly no interaction, I mean, the, the additive interaction is exactly zero. And if sample size isn't an issue, so you take it to infinity, that implies that there must be an interaction on the multiplicative scale. And the same thing in reverse happens. If you have an interaction term such that the risk ratio of R11 over the product of the R00 times R10 is exactly equal to one, that implies there must be an interaction on the additive scale. So this isn't just a kind of a trivial issue. It's, a, it's something that's fundamental to interactions and, and, their, and their detection. And so while I said that it's usually but not often the case that the direction of the interactions is the same, 
uh, it's very easy for the significance of those g by e terms to differ. So it's, it's, it's it would be very common, for example, to get a 0 0.02 or 0 0.006 p-value for on a logistic regression scale, but then when you go and look at it on an additive scale, um, you get a p-value of 0.16 or something like that. So there are a couple of questions. Jonathan. Well, maybe you'll get to that, but to what extent is the same uh, using the same point for a quantitative trace? Like, is it quantitative trace you don't have? Like, probabilities have a, a kind of a natural scale. Yeah, it isn't something that I cover a lot, but I, the scale is going to matter there this, the exact, in the exact same way. So this, it will absolutely depend on the scale. So if you're think, talking about the variance of y versus the variance of the log of y, then you're going to get different answers depending on which of those two you do. Yeah. Can you add, do a little bit more translation for us in terms of, let's say this is an example of the effect on depression that has to get off at its original published. Yep. I understand that it, you, know, you want to test both and report both. Yep. But beyond saying that this is you know, less than what we expected in the edit case and this is more greater than what we expected in the multiplicative case, yep. can you just translate that into, into that particular example? Yeah. Okay, I think, you know, I'm going to get to something like that in a second, okay, in which I, I kind of lay out why it is the case that, well, let me, let me hold off for just one sec, and then at the end of that, then maybe if we can get back to that, because I think that I, I do cover this in, in like two slides from now. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the, the logistic regression model. Mm -hmm. The, the way, let me just be clear here. That, wait, wait one, one sec before, because let me get back to your question in one sec. But let me just be clear. Um, the way that I've been talking about interactions so far is not, I haven't really talked about odds ratios. I've talked about relative risks. And so that's using a log linear model. And there's ways that you could model this. You could use a log linear model, or you could use a logistic link or, or logistic regression. And I haven't really covered that yet. But anyway, so that, I just wanted to kind of clear that up. So what was the, the question that you had? I was just trying to map it onto the different models. Mm -hmm. So logistic regression is going to be equivalent to the multiplicative model. It's just a slightly different transformation of y. Rather than thinking about, rather than thinking about the risk ratios, we're talking about ratios of odds. And all an odd is, is just a P, you know, the probability divided by 1 minus that same probability. So you're talking about ratios of odds rather than ratios of, prob of risks. And in practice, for something, especially for something where the probability is fairly low, like schizophrenia, even, well, depression maybe is, is getting a little bit too high, the answers for those are almost identical because you're dividing by you know, point, some small probability by 0.99 rather than by 1 but they're almost the same. Um, okay. Okay, so this is what I wanted to get to because I think this might help, but if not, let, we can talk about it more. Okay, so, uh, so there's been a lot of debate about which scale, which is equivalent to which model, um, should be used to, uh, to um, assess interactions, at least for categorical outcomes. I think for a lot of social science research, if you're using something that's continuous, you have to admit that the scale that you've measured this on is, is fairly arbitrary, right? And so whether you're talking about it as an as a original scale that you measured it on, which might just be a, uh, a sum, right, a sum of a bunch of different variables, or some transformation of that sum. And a problem with the sum, of course, is that there is a relationship often between, well, there should be a relationship between the mean and the variance. So if you're thinking about a uh, binomially distributed variable or Poisson distributed variable, there's going to be a relationship between the, the mean and the variance. And so you will, de you will detect an interaction just by virtue of the way the data was collected. And so there uh, can be attempts to transform those, the mean-variance relationships away. But, you know, I think the issue is that, you know, some people say that what you should do is kind of make all the transformations you can to make that interaction go away. I think that's probably taking it a bit too far. I, be, I, I think maybe the better way to think about it is that there is an interaction on this scale but just admit that there might not be interactions if we had transformed the data in a different way. Okay, anyway, that was a, a, a non sequitur. Um, so there's been debate about which scale is relevant and how to assess interactions on categorical outcomes. And the general conclusion from this is that the additive scale is of greater public health importance and is the most intuitive. Um, so it allows one to discern which subgroup would benefit most from adding or removing the environmental moderator, in this case, of interest. Um, 
However, almost all studies that are published are published on the multiplicative scale, which is the one that is the most difficult to understand and is the one that probably has the least public health relevance. Um, and that's probably due to uh, the kind of the statistical model logistic regression, regression that people routinely use for, for binary outcomes. Um, you know, somebody hands you a data set and it's a zero one outcome, you're going to reach and you're going to do regression, you're just going to automatically reach into lo and do logistic regression. And I think that's a mistake and we'll talk about the alternatives to that in a sec. Yep. So I don't think I understand the point about the additive scale allowing you to discern which subgroup would benefit. It comes, it's the very next slide. Okay. Yep. Yep. We're getting into, I'm going to explain what I mean by this. It's the, of the great, greatest public health importance and it allows you to discern which subgroup would benefit most by removing out of it. That's what the whole next slide's about. Um, I think it's probably best to report it on both scales and um, let the reader decide what the evidence for that interaction is after doing that. Um, and by the way, so you know, people s think that there's something wrong with doing just ordinary least squares on a zero one outcome. Um, there's a great paper by Helovic that came out in 09 that tries to blow that out of the water. And so he's saying, no, there's really, there's no problem. I mean, the only problem really, the only reason, the, the only real good motivation for using logistic regression is if you're trying to make predictions. And then logistic regression will rightfully make your predicted outcomes, your Y hats, vary between zero and one. And if that's your goal, that's fine. Use logistic regression. Otherwise, it's perfectly fine to use OLS just on a zero one outcome variable. I mean, unless you have a very small sample size, the, the, you're going to get, due to the central limit theorem, your distribution of your betas is going to be basically normal once you get past, you, you know, or t-distributed once you get past, like, sample sizes of 50 or something, much, much smaller than what we're worried about here. And the, the, p, the, 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 the slope of the p-values between, a, 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 this is not, I have to be careful about what, how I say that. I, I think that's going to be confusing, so forget that. So anyway, I think there's really no real good reason not to use ordinary least squares on this. So, and there's a good paper, if you're interested, by Helovic in 09 that went over this. Um, okay, so this gets to, to Dan's question a second ago. So let's, let's take a, a, a kind of a, um, a thought experiment here. So suppose that E denotes the drug, a drug for schizophrenia. And the outcome is, is that you don't have symptoms. Um, who should obtain the drug? And um, so, th so in other words, this is, we want a high value here. We want some, we want the, uh, so this is a the schizophrenia only sample. And this is the percent of people after, after this study that don't show any schizophrenia symptoms. All right. Um, so you see that with, uh, with both the, this particular genetic variant, this is the, the protective genetic variant, or no, this is the risk genetic variant and the risk environment, only about 2% of people uh, remit, don't have symptoms. So the vast majority of them still have symptoms. Whereas if you have the protective gene and, and you get the drug, um, about 40% of people don't have symptoms anymore. So you can see, obviously, there's an effect of the drug here, right, among the GO, the people with this genetic variant. The drug helps, and the drug helps here with people with this genetic variant. The question is wh whether we should be giving the drug to people with G equals zero or the people, the, the people with schizophrenia who have this genetic variant. So what do people think? So you're getting two different answers here, right, both based on the additive or the multiplicative case. In the additive case, right, we have, you do this math, and it looks like it's a positive interaction. So the combination of getting this genetic variant and E is better than giving, than, than, either, than you'd expect from just the, the, uh, the marginal effects. Yep. Well, is it both of them? Well, right, okay, but obviously, right. <laughs> that is obviously the right answer. The obvious right, right answer, you give it to everyone. But let's just, I mean, I think this is, this is a demonstration for what the public health relevance is. So let's say that we've got only 1,000 doses that we can give, all right? We have 1,000 people with G equals zero and 1,000 people with G equal one. All right, and we do the interaction study, and now we're going to get we're getting two different answers here, right? Under the additive model, it looks like we should be getting the we should be giving those those thousand doses to people who have G equal one, right? Because the effect of them together is better than the effect of of uh, than than either one not than the, just the additive effects. If we do the multiplicative model, right, it's a negative interaction. So the com combination of G equal one and drug is worse than additive. So we should be giving the drug to G equals zero, okay? So if you 
think about this, right? If we have a thousand people, this is, gets to the question that was just that just came up. We've got a thousand cases with g equals zero, right? And a thousand cases with g equal one, but we only have a thousand doses, right? This is where it becomes relevant. If we give the drug to g equals zero, which is what the, the multiplicative model would seem to suggest because the combination is worse than you'd expect, right? The getting g equal one and equal one is, is worse than we'd expect. Then um, if we give it to g equals zero, then we're just gonna say a, a thousand people Right? We give it to 1,000 people with g equals zero. So 1,000 times 10%. So we're going to get, say, about 100 people there, plus 1,000 times 0.15. These are people who are going to go in remission if they didn't get the drug at all. Okay? So we get 250 cures plus remissions. 100 cures and 150 remissions, right, if we give it to g equals zero. Okay? If we give the drug to g equal one, we're going to have 1,000 times 40, right, equal one, g equal one, 1,040, 1,000 times 0.4, which is 400 cures, plus uh, 1,000 times 0.02 remissions, or in other words, 420 cures. So if you think about this in just terms of public health relevance, it's obvious in this toy example that we should be giving the drug to people who have G equals zero. The additive interaction correctly identified that, right? To g equal one, did I say g equal zero? Yes, yeah, so obviously we should be giving it to g equal one. And the additive model correctly identified that. The, the combination of g equal one and e equal one was better than we'd expected. The multiplicative model got it exactly wrong. It said the combination of g equal one and e equal one is worse than should be expected. We should give it to g equal zero, okay? Does that answer the question, Dan? So I want to talk about the models that we use. So we usually use regression in this, this to, to, to detect interactions here. So we've got, um, in this case, this is uh, just a, a continuous or a binary outcome, and we regress it on G and E and the product of those two. And the product is what's going to test that interaction. So, um, so G, E here is the product of G and E. And beta 3, I'm sorry, that should be beta I. That's a mistype. Beta I, beta interaction, tests what's called a bilinear interaction. And so the way that we interpret that term in an interaction model is that for every one increase in E, that the beta G, the effect of G, increases by that much. You could do it the reverse too, right? For every one increase in G, the, if the slope of E increases or changes by beta I, okay? This, this is obvious if you kind of rearrange this formula here. So this is beta naught plus beta G, G times beta EE e times beta I times a product. If we just collapse these two terms together, right, and we have beta E plus beta I G, we could call this the conditional slope, beta star E, right, because it is a slope of E. And here you see that if G is equal to zero, right, if G is equal to zero, the slope of E is equal to beta E, right? If B, if G is equal to one, the slope of E is equal to beta E plus beta I. If G is equal to two, if we had it, if we coded the zero, one, two, for example, then the slope of E would be beta E plus two beta I, okay? And you can do the exact same thing for beta G. But this is an important formula, so, it, because one, it gives you the, it, it, it says that, that beta E, or the beta I, is the, uh, is, the, uh, is the increase in the slope for either one of these two factors as you increase the other factor by one. I think it's also important because it tells you how we should be interpreting this beta E in regression and this beta G. Do I get to that in the next slide? Yeah, okay. Why? Because beta E here is the effect of the environment when you are at zero on G, and that's crucial, right? So if you just do a linear regression and you include an interaction term, and the means and the two variables E and G haven't been mean-centered, or the, the zero points outside of the range of the data, what you're often going to see is that that effect of beta G and that effect of beta E will change dramatically, and the significance will change dramatically. It's crucial that you understand what that means, right? So what that means is that at the, that is the slope, the predicted slope, for example, for beta E, when G is at zero, 
which might not make any sense in the context of your study. So if you're studying, maybe, do I have it on the next? Yeah, I do, okay. 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 So, um, so when interpreting simple effects in a model containing the product term, you must be aware and report the coding of and interpretation of zero in both E and G. And this frustratingly is very rarely done. Uh, a kind of a common way that people do this, uh, which, is, which is good, uh, is to, just to center your variables, okay? which is take E and transform it by taking E minus the mean of E, and take G and take G minus the mean of G. And now your effect of beta E, what that is interpreted as, is it's the effect of the environment at the mean level of the genotype. And by the same token, in that model, if you'd centered both of your E and G variables, the effect of G is the effect of the genotype at the mean level of the environment, right? Because beta E is the effect of the environment at zero level of G. And beta G is the effect of the genotype at the zero level of E. It's therefore crucial to know what the zero level of E and G are. It's not exactly centering because if, if you have the equal numbers of one, negative one and, and one, it's the same thing as centering. But otherwise, it's, it's the, it's the mid-level between the two groups. I guess I was just wondering because I can't intuitively see why one interpretation is better than the other. Why do you like a model that has centering in it? I mean, I... You usually do like or don't? It's not, no, no, that's not right. So that's a very common misunderstanding of what, what's going on. So the, the issue is that the, 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 the standard errors of beta are, are going to depend on whether you, you center or not. But it, you have to be aware of what, that's, what those standard errors are, where those standard errors are being, uh, being, un, being uh, calculated for on the level of the other variable, right? So let, let me, I, I'll, I'm going to talk about that. Let me do this, and then I'll come right back to that point, because I think it's easier with, a, with an example here. So if E is age, then beta G is the extrapolated genetic effect of birth. If we don't center E, right, and E is just age, then the effect of the gene is the, is the expected effect of the, gen, of the gene at birth, which probably makes no sense. So this gets to your point, right? The standard error is going to increase because it's way outside the range of the data. Right? But I think more to the point is that that effect that we're now trying to understand, that beta, the effect of G, is, is an extrapolated effect that's outside of the range of the data and really shouldn't be interpreted at all. Right? So I think the better way to do this is to make sure that you've coded your, your E variable as potentially, for E, I think the better way to do it would be just to center E. And now the beta, the beta G you have is the predicted genetic effect at the mean age, and also the standard errors are the standard errors of the, of the genotypic effect at the mean in, of age in your sample. Um, I think uh, what I was worried about actually was the collinearity between these when they don't Yeah, so, so, the, so, okay, so this issue of collinearity so it turns out that the, the, so the, the collinearity won't change, that has no effect on the, on the interaction term at all, right? right. The, it does have an effect on, on, the, on these other effects. Uh, and it's true that the, that, the, that, the, that the correlation between centered variables and their products is going to be a lot lower. But it's really about the interpretation of that, of that beta E or beta G, the, the simple, what's called the simple effects. I think probably if your goal is to interpret simple effects, you really shouldn't, you either should center or better yet, you probably should just leave the interaction out altogether. Right? So if, if what you want to do is understand the effect of just age on your phenotype, there's two ways to do that. Okay, one is to center, in which case the effect of beta E is at the mean level. I think a way that's almost equivalent, but, but uh, is probably better because you get even smaller standard errors, is just to leave the interaction out altogether. 
So to, it, to interpret the effect of E, just leave the interaction out altogether, and then you get beta E in that model. Uh, but in practice, that's going to be very, very similar to beta E when G is centered. So, yep. It still makes it still makes sense. It's still the average in your sample, regardless of whether it's male, female. I mean, it's it's not. It, there's nobody in your sample who's zero, right? But if males are negative 0.5 and females are 0.5, it's still at the mean in your in your sample. So it's still perfectly okay to do it. Alternatively, if you want a cleaner interpretation, you could just leave it at zero one, right? And then or negative one one. But it, I think the point is, 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 there's not a right or wrong way to do it. It's just crucial that you know what that zero level is so that you can explain what those terms mean. So if you've coded female as zero and male as one, for example, then it's crucial that you know that the beta G factor that you have is the predicted effect among females. If you code female as negative one and male as one, beta G becomes the predicted genetic effect on average if you have equal numbers of males and females. Yeah. That's same question. Okay. Is there, yep. Uh, so you're saying to stratify by different E's, like say you have E0, E1, E, E2, and show the different slopes for each of those? Yeah, yeah. You, you could do that. Um, I mean, certainly if, you know, if you've got a lot of levels of E, you're going to have a lot of different plots that you're going to have to show. Um, like one more than all text plot. Like Yep, I think that's perfectly. I think that's perfectly fine to do that. I mean, I think in general, I mean, you you just want to. You don't want to just. And this, you know, we've I've gone through enough of these papers to get really frustrated by it. That it's just so rare for people to actually try to understand their data, rather than what they want to really do is report a really low p-value for the interaction. And it just gets. It's it's very frustrating. Um, when you don't, I mean, we're trying to go back now, a, a grad student and I, we're, we're doing a paper, a, a kind of a review on, on um, just candidate gene studies in general. And um, one part of that is G by E. And uh, it's, we'd, we'd like to do all kinds of things to, 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 to demonstrate that what we think is a very high false positive rate. But to do those things, we need to know what the coding was for these different effects. And I think maybe only 20% of papers or something like that have all the information that we actually need to do it appropriately. It's just really frustrating. And of course, at that point, you can't really use it because it's probably a biased sample. You know, the, the, the people who actually reported it correctly are the ones who are probably doing it right or probably the ones who are... I uh, should be uh, careful what I say, but anyway, <clears throat> yeah. Was there another question? Okay. Uh, so, and all this to say, you know, beware of interpreting simple effects in interaction models. Uh, to interpret them, you really should either mean center your variables or interpret them in a model not containing the product term. I should also add to this, just, or just have them in a, in a kind of a way where the zero level of the other variable is logical. Maybe it's the homozygote for the minor allele, in which case, the, or the major allele, better yet, or if you're wanting to interpret beta E, or it's, uh, you know, 0, 1, 2 for, you know, no high school, high school and above, college, or whatever. And then you understand what that beta G is, is telling you. But it's crucial to know that, that those t other two terms are at the zero level of the other, other variable. Okay, so um, getting back a bit just to, to the scale, I, I'm going to go through this uh, kind of quickly because it's, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse now. So regression models on an additive scale. So uh, we could just do this with an ordinary least squared. Okay, so we just have a vector of ones and zeros and we just do uh, ordinary least squares and get an answer. This would be on an additive scale and uh, the betas that you get here would be equal to the various proportions in this, uh, in this box, and you can, you can prove to yourself that that's correct. Um, on an, um, this is the results, by the way, for the Caspi model um, for that on an additive scale. So you do see that there is this uh, very strong interaction, uh, very strong evidence for an interaction uh, according to those. Now, I, I should also note that these, this isn't the, uh, the model that Caspi actually used. 
because yes, he, he included the, uh, the header zygotes in there too. So this is just kind of a toy example that I've used. So this, the, the uh, strength of this interaction is, is lower in, in his paper um, than what I've presented here. I just included the, the two homozygotes for simplicity. Um, so on a multiplicative scale, we can think of two different um, link functions. One is the log linear uh, function. This is where we just take the log of those probabilities. And this is exactly what I was presenting before. This, this, this uh, reverts back to just the risk ratios. So think about the log of PY, if we take the exponent of that, the probabilities is just the exponent of the sum of those, those terms there, which is the same thing as the product of each of those exponents. And so when, um, when you do that, the exponent of beta zero, when these other guys are, uh, are zero, 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 is just the probability of zero, zero. The exponent of the BG is just the risk ratio of one, zero. The exponent of the BE is the risk ratio of zero, one. And the exponent of the interaction is the risk ratio of one, one divided by those other two risk ratios. So it's exactly what I was talking about before. If you use the, 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 uh, the log link function for a log linear regression model, you get back to the, the risk ratio uh, multiplicative scale that I was talking about a second ago. Uh, more commonly, people think about this in terms of odds ratios because they use logistic regression. It's nearly the same thing, except rather than taking just the log of the probabilities, we take the log of the odds, which is just the probability divided by one minus that probability. Um, and here, the exponent of beta of the intercept is just the probability, it's just the odds of that first, first cell. So in this case, I think that was 0.02, so this would have been 0.02 divided by 0.98, about the same thing, right? So if, if there's a very low uh, probability, then these turn, turn out to be almost the same. Uh, log, log linear and logistic regression turn out to be almost the same. The um, exponent of your beta G term is the odds ratio for the genetic term. Um, the exponent of BE is the odds ratio for the environment. And the exponent for the interaction is the odds ratio of, of one, one times divided by the product of the other two odds ratios. So beta i still tests the interaction here, but now it's on another multiplicative scale. In this case, it's on the uh, odds ratio scale. You can also take these coefficients and transform them to make them so that they're expressed on the additive scale, right? Because you can calculate them. That's, well, you could, you right? And, and that's right. That's, ex yeah. that's exactly right. And I think that, that's what you probably should do. But it's just important to know that the, that the statistical evidence for that interaction will change depending on whether you've done it with this model or with uh, yes, just a, yes, yes, yes. yeah. yeah. One issue with um, using the logic for the previous slide, like the, uh, the log. The log. Okay, I'm not completely sure why. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I didn't know that. So, what is that? What paper is it? Okay. Okay, great. Am I moving around a lot for the camera person? <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, okay, so I want to turn now to uh, covariates in interaction models and, um, and how to correctly control for, for covariates. So uh, in genetic epidemiology, it's often crucial that we, uh, that we control for covariates like ethnicity correctly. And the same thing should be of concern in G by E research. Um, an observed G by E effect may be due to some unmeasured confounder. Um, however, covariates are almost always modeled incorrectly in G by E research, and that can lead to incorrect inference. This is a, a, a paper I did three years ago. I, I, in fact, in every, I think it was 49 studies that I looked at, I think in every one of them, it was not, in none of them was it do, done correctly. In a, in a handful of them, they did it in, in ways that were getting close to being right. And I think in maybe one or two, they, they did it in a way that's extremely conservative and they still found the effect, but it, it probably wasn't the best way to do it. 
but and none of them were they using this the way that I'll show, and I, I think it's just a, um, a, a much better way and, and, and retains the maximal amount of power. Um, so let C be the uh, variable we want to control for. So the incorrect but usual way to control for, for C is just to control for its main effect. So this is the same interaction model that we had before. Y could be just regular Y, or it might be the uh, log of Y, or the log of the odds ratios of Y, or whatever, but this is the uh, model that we had. And then you just control for the main effects of the covariate in the model. The problem is that does not control for the effect of that covariate on the interaction itself. I'll demonstrate that in just a second. So the correct way that this should be controlled for is to control for the main effect, but also control for the covariate by G interaction, as well as the covariate by E interaction in that model as well. And this will then control for the potential effect that covariate has on this, uh, on this interaction term. So for example, so let's say that C dummy codes for African versus European ancestry. And say we're interested in whether Alzheimer's disease is affected by the APOE4 variant, by carbohydrate intake, and by their interaction. Okay? So this is what we're interested in. We know that there's a mixed ethnicity sample, so we want to control for that. So um, let's say that this is the case that this is actually true, that E4 is more frequent in people of African descent. So if it's the case that carb intake on Alzheimer's disease is different for Africans versus Europeans, then the apparent G by E effect that we find, let's say that we find some G by E effect, may actually be just an ancestry by E effect. It may be that, that the effect of carbs depend or are different for people of African versus European ancestry on the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. I have a graph, I, I go through this in a, in a second if it's not clear yet. Um, similarly, if uh, people of African descent say eat uh, more carbs and the effect of E4 on Alzheimer's disease risk is different between Africans and Europeans. In other words, that the effect of APOE4 differs between these. And there's also evidence this is actually true. Um, it's actually E4 is less of a risk factor for people of African descent for Alzheimer's disease. Um, then the apparent G by E may actually just be a G by ancestry effect. Um, both scenarios here are appropriately controlled in this full model. So let, let me go through an example here. Okay, so let's say this is what's really going on in the universe, right? So we have this confounding example. So um, this is the uh, risk of, of getting Alzheimer's disease, and this is the carb intake. And we have uh, among African Americans, carbohydrate, carbohydrate intake has a big effect on your, this is, by the way, I should be very clear, completely made up data. Okay, this is not, this is not true. I, or I have no idea if this is true. It's a completely made up example. Um, but let's say that the effect of carbohydrate intake has a big effect if you are uh, of African descent, but doesn't have much of an effect, if any at all, on individuals of European descent. Well, the problem here is that there are E4 is more common among people of African descent, and E3 is more common among people of European descent. And therefore, right, being, uh, being African American, or I'm sorry, being of African descent is a weak proxy for also for being E4. And being European descent is a weak proxy for being E3. And therefore, this effect right here might in turn drive uh, an observed interaction. Obviously, the interaction that you observe won't be exactly the same as this, but it will influence the, the strength of evidence for this interaction that we have here. So if we just looked at this alone, in a mixed ethnicity sample and we control for ethnicity, we might see something like this, where it looks like that, oh, carbon intake's really bad for people with E4, but actually carbon intake is good or maybe not so bad for people with, with E3, and we make an incorrect conclusion about the G by E effect, uh, APOE4 by carbon intake interaction effect. When really what was driving that effect was just the ancestry um, by carb intake effect. And the same thing can happen if we uh, go in the, going the other way. Here we've got uh, APOE4 variant, and um, we have uh, that, for, that the E4 variant is a big risk factor for people of European descent. It's a m milder risk factor for people of African descent. And if it's the case that people of African descent eat more carbs in the sample that's being looked at here, and Europeans eat fewer carbs, then this uh, 
ApoE4, this gene by ethnicity interaction, will masquerade as a gene by environment interaction if there's a difference between the environment uh, across the two ethnicities. And both of those, those two effects will be controlled properly if you include the uh, covariate by E and the covariate by G interactions. Yep. So what exactly is the difference between covariate and the environment in this model? Well, the environment is, what I'm saying is the, is the moderator, and the covariate here is the ethnicity. I suppose you could. I think it depends. I mean, if you're trying to make a conclusion about African American by carb, you know, interaction, then you might want to, and, and you're interested in controlling for genotype, then the genotype becomes the covariate. It just depends on what it is that you're, what, what it is that you're interested in. No, I'm, I'm not saying the difference between G and C. I'm saying the difference between E and C. So the difference between the carbs being what the ancestry is. Right. Uh huh. So. Exactly. The difference between carbohydrate intake and ancestry? Yep. Uh, well, I, I guess I'm not understanding your question because the answer is obvious, so I'm just. So, so they're different in the sense that they yeah. measure different things. But as far as calling one the environment and the other one a covariate, what, what is the justification for that? I th yeah, I think it just comes back to the, what it is that you're interested in studying. So a lot of people are going to be interested in studying you know, a carbohydrate by gene interaction. That's what, they're, that's what they're interested in, and to them, ethnicity is a, you know, is a variable that they're trying to control for, right? Now, it could be the case that somebody else is interested in ethnicity by um, gene interaction, and there you'd want to control for carb intake or whatever the other variable thing, var various things are. So I think it just depends on what your, what your research question of interest is. So maybe I'm... So just one comment about this. Yeah. I think if you do it the way Matt suggested, then you treat them all symmetrically. So you could, you could, you know, that's the right. results you get, you could end up, you could interpret whatever, either way. Maybe that's a better way of answering that question. So, yeah, so here, I mean, you know, it just depends. I mean, you know, C by G is going to be the true interaction effect, right? Conditional on ethnicity and E, right? So, I mean, so it just depends. Are you interested in CE? Are you interested in CG? Are you interested in GE? Yeah. I, 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 Okay, I think I get your question better. Yeah, yeah. So once you expand and include C, why are you not interacting C with GE? It seems like uh, you, you're missing one last interaction term, right? You mean a three-way interaction? Yeah. Um, because that three-way interaction is not going to be confounded with any of the two-way interactions. So if you're interested in making conclusions about the two-way interactions, then you're going to properly, they're going to be properly controlled by including all the covariate by... Yeah, but, but, in, in, but in the end, it may still be interesting. It, um, yeah. If the two in, I mean, yeah. back to the previous point, I mean, yeah. there are two things, are two different environmental variables yeah. who also have an interaction that may affect potentially. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, it, you know, it, it, I think that is possible. I, you have to, you have to, at some point, you have to kind of give up on these interactions, though, because the power for a, a, a two-way interaction is substantially lower than the power of the main effects on, on average, unless you've got a lot of joint extremes in your data. And then the power of a three-way interaction is even worse because you have to have not joint extremes but triplet extremes, uh, and so your power just d declines very rapidly. So I, I you know, I, I, I do, I have seen plenty of studies that look at three-way interactions, but I just think it's kind of hopeless. And the question is just what, what question are you asking? Like, if if the thing that you're really interested in is the three-way interaction, then I guess you need to include it. Um, but uh, but like the the whole point of this whole thing is what we want to know is does the, the genotype uh, affect how the environment affects our, our outcome or, or, or something along those lines. And so that's a, that's a two-way interaction question. Yeah, but, but you're, you're saying that the ethnicity plays a role, and if the ethnicity only plays a role through in a certain environment, then mm -hmm. it becomes a... Yep. Uh, that's, the problem is yep. like basically you're saying, I was omitting a variable, but yep. you're stopping when... Yeah, and uh, it's, a, it's a good, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, if that's what you're interested in, then, then, then I guess you would look at that, look at the three-way interaction. But, you know, the other point is that if you do include the three-way interaction and there's other covariates you're worried about, now you have to include all the second-order lower terms and all the three-way interactions with those covariates. So it just very quickly becomes a model that's never going never gonna to work very well. Um, you've got to have enormous sample sizes, I guess, to be able to detect a three-way interaction. There's plenty of them out there published, though, so... Was there, was there another question?
Okay. Okay. All right, so that's the confounding stuff. Um, so I'm going to turn briefly to, uh, just briefly get on a soapbox about candidate gene studies. Now, I imagine that people have talked about candidate gene studies already, so I don't think I need to go into much depth here. So, so candidate gene studies related trait are a small set to a small set of genetic, one or a small set of genetic polymorphisms. So really, uh, I just want to make one, a few points here. So first of all, the candidate gene really is a misnomer. It's not a candidate gene, it's a candidate polymorphism that people have chosen. So they, they choose a particular gene that, that are, that's based on some kind of prior, based on biology. And then within that gene, they choose a particular polymorphism, again, based on some kind of biological insight. Uh, so it really should probably better be called a candidate gene polymorphism study than a candidate gene study. Um, historically, those have been chosen based on theory about what should biologically affect a trait. Um, but that has since kind of taken a life of its own. And if you look at the literature, really there's only a kind of a handful of, of, uh, of usual suspects, gene, candidate gene polymorphisms that get called out and trotted out again and again and again in these studies. DRD2, COMP, SLIC64A, um, DRD4, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and often the original motivation for choosing those has, is completely, uh, has, been, has been blown out of the water by GWAS, but people continue to use those just almost based on historical precedent. So because there's all this literature for people looking at it, this trait and that trait and this other trait, we're going to look at it for this new trait and we're going to interact, potentially uh, look at the interaction with some particular environmental moderator. Um, um, so despite the large number of positive reports in this, uh, in this literature, um, really it's almost none of these have been supported by much larger GWAS studies on non-tobacco related complex traits. I think uh, there, there, there are exceptions for addiction in the addiction literature like tobacco and obviously APOE is, is, a, is a big effect gene, but I, that really wasn't found using the, the same kind of candidate gene approach that people from which people jo chose COMP and, and DRD2. It was, it was found in, in a different way. So, um, candidate gene researchers uh, counter the lack of GWAS evidence uh, replication by saying that these GWAS studies can't measure traits as well as small N studies or that simple additive models don't capture the true biological complexity. Um, and, you know, even though it's basically unheard of in mainstream genetics to, to do these studies, I mean, you will never anymore see in Nature Genetics or in American Journal of Human Genetics or PLOS Genetics, you, you will never find a study anymore in which somebody's looking at COMPT or looking at DRD2. Um, there are literally thousands of these published every year still. And they're often done in fields like psychology and sociology and economics and uh, in the social sciences, really among people who haven't kind of uh, been there to see the really sordid history of how this has played out over the last 15 years in genetics. Um, so, you know, now we're, the paper that we're writing is really trying to take on these, these particular arguments and I think it can be done in a purely uh, rigorous way by just saying, well, okay, if you think that a smaller study is measuring the trait that much better, what would the correlation or how much noise would there have to be in a GWAS study? in order to find the, the, the effect in a small candidate gene study but not find it in a GWAS. And it turns out that correlation has to be really close to zero um, between the two different traits that you're measuring. Um, so, uh, and that same kind of argument can work for end phenotypes as well. So, so basically the only time that a candidate gene study would find something that a GWAS wouldn't, uh, well, that a candidate gene end phenotype study would find something that a candidate, that a GWAS on a, on a downstream complex trait wouldn't find is if that end of phenotype has basically no relationship to the, uh, to the phenotype under study. And, and in other words, in, in, only if it's a really bad end of phenotype. Can so, you what an is yeah, so <clears throat> an end of phenotype is a kind of hypo, uh, is a hypothesized phenotype underlying a complex trait that's hopefully genetically sim simpler, but it's related to that complex trait, kind of a more basic bi biological phenotype. So for schizophrenia, you might imagine there's a lot of different you know, schizophrenia is kind of a complex downstream phenotype that a lot of different things are going to affect biologically. An endophenotype would be a, a, a kind of a better, more biologically based phenotype that is hopefully going to be heritable and hopefully related in some way to schizophrenia. So for example, the amount of pruning between the amygdala and the hippocampus or something like that that we can measure with an MRI study. And so you'll see this a lot. This happens all the time in neuroscience literature 
that um, in a sample of 84 people, we looked at the effect of COMPT on the uh, amount of connection between the amygdala and the hippocampus, and we have a p-value of 0 0.003, and, and this suggests that, you know, COMPT is a, is a major player in, this, in the phenotype of schizophrenia, but the problem is, is that that almost certainly can't be true quantitatively, unless that endophenotype really has no relationship to schizophrenia. Um, and it just, there's a lot of other hints in the literature that, this, that these kind of things look like they're going the same way that all the candidate gene stuff went before. Um, so it, I'm not saying that endophenotypes aren't genetically simpler. What I'm really saying is that the, our ability to correctly guess a priori at the relevant can, candidate polymorphisms is probably close to zero. That's right, and I think there's another point uh, is that you know we, we also live in an age where the the cost of getting a GWAS uh, array is basically the same as getting a custom array. So why on earth would you uh, why on earth would you just look at 30 polymorphisms when you can get 10 million, right? Because with an array of 30, 000, uh, 300,000 tag snips, you're going to be able to impute up to basically all the common variants. So you're saying that we're going to willfully neglect 99.999% of variants out there and just focus on these for the exact same cost. It doesn't make, it, that to me makes no sense. So. Um, was it, are the phenotype studies just still also underpowered? I think they're uh, underpowered. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it depends on what the effect is, but I think that there's two issues. I mean, how big the effect is in the endophenotypes. So I mean, there's the hope that the endophenotypes are genetically simpler, and I think that, that, that might, maybe that's true. I mean, it, give, give the benefit of the doubt that that's true. Um, I think the, the bigger issue, though, is are we going to be able to guess what the relevant polymorphisms are? And um, certainly, uh, the history has shown that, that we've been very, very poor at guessing. So even if the effect sizes are bigger, our ability to guess at what the relevant polymorphism is is still probably close to zero. Anybody want to? Argue, debate. <laughs> I, I don't think you need the tobacco caveat there. I mean, they had a bunch of genes. One of the less studied candidate genes showed up in that GWAS. It wasn't the, the Mr. Big. Yeah, yeah, the SNPs that they found, but those were found by a GWAS. So the Mr. Big was yeah, big word. Given the, 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 the particular nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that, that showed that Mr. Big is in, as David is saying, was not one of the candidate genes that was getting the most attention. Okay. Yeah. Ones. Yeah, we've just done a, a study that, I, that should be getting published soon that, um, where we, we, we know that, that in schizophrenia, none of the candidate genes worked out, like none of them. Uh, at, uh, so that, that was a paper by um, Sullivan Farrell at all, I think it was in 2013. So none of them uh, actually replicated in, in, the, in the bigger GWAS. But we said, well, well, maybe that's being too strict. So rather than um, looking at the polymorphisms themselves, let's actually look at the candidate genes. So maybe they got the polymorphisms right. But I, and what motivated this is if you look in the uh, PGC schizophrenia data, it turns out that a lot of the candidate genes are, are highly significant. I mean, that there are, let me back up. A lot of the highly significant um, uh, polymorphisms are in candidate genes, or several of them are in, in candidate genes. And so we said, well, let's take all the p-values from the candidate genes and see if that differs from what you'd expect based on just choosing genes at random in the genome. And basically, if you choose genes at random in the genome, you do about as well as you did as you do choosing the collection of all the candidate genes from the, from, from the literature. So even with that kind of watered-down hypothesis, it turns out, not even looking at the particular polymorphisms, but looking at the genes themselves, uh, it turns out that there's really no signal, basically no signal at all of all those candidate genes. So we're talking about thousands of studies that have been done on these, hundreds of thousands of person hours dedicated to this, tens of millions of grant dollars spent on this, and really, uh, after 10 or 15 years, nothing to show. <coughs> Yeah. That's maybe the most promising place to find uh, yeah. I think that's I, th I think that's fine. I certainly wouldn't argue with that. But I also like how it illustrates what an endophenotype is. So that's just the next step in the process is does the gene get expressed? Yeah, and uh, yeah, don't take what I'm saying as being like negative endophenotype. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and I think that, but I, I do think the point here is that the way that people are choosing a candidate for that type of study that you described is a lot different than the way people are choosing candidates here. I think the way that you're talking about choosing a candidate in that expression study, 
from looking at genes nearby is kind of a principled way to do it. I still would argue there's no reason to, to, to just look at those genes. I mean, why not get the genome-wide data and look at kind of uh, look at uh, expression that might be further away? Yeah. But yeah. Five, years ago, cost yeah. Know, these are that's a good point too. I mean, these are good points for me to hear as we're writing this. So, other thoughts? Okay, I'm almost done. So, um, just the last few slides here. Um, so, can it G by E in false positive rates? So, there's been um, hundreds of. Uh, It's taken a little while. So there's been hundreds of pubs on candidate gene, what I call CG by E, from the same 25 usual suspects, um, initially chosen based on main effect reports that subsequently didn't replicate. But then those are trotted out again uh, to look for interaction effects. Um, so, there's a, so there's kind of some interesting um, signals in that literature if you take the literature as a whole and kind of look at it. So first of all, Almost all of the novel findings for candidate gene by environment interaction research report a positive result. 96% of them do. So you almost will never find a report that says, hey, we looked at this particular polymorphism, interacted with this particular environment, we found nothing. Why? <laughs> because it's really hard to publish. You know? So there's going to be a huge publication bias out there for starters, right? So, so if you're just looking at the, at the extant literature and trying to make conclusions, you've got to be very careful because you're looking at an extremely biased sample. Um, if you look at replications of those, attempted replications, only 25, only 27 percent of those uh, direct replication attempts uh, are, are positive. I should have said are positive here. Um, although that number is a lot higher for non-direct replications, so we just restricted them to direct replications where it's the same model, the same genetic polymorphism, and the same environmental moderator. But, you know, CARG at all showed that if you expand that and you allow for different models, maybe a dominance model, or maybe only among females, or, or maybe it's not a traumatic stress life event, maybe it's just being living through a hurricane, or all these kind of things, then yeah, then, then the replication uh, rate is much, much higher. But I would argue that th that's just another example of, of indirect or novel findings. Indirect replications are an example of novel findings, and we, we already know what's going on there. There's a huge publication bias. Um, also, there's this very strange thing, uh, if, if, uh, if you believe that these are true, that the larger the replication attempt is, the less likely it is to replicate. The less likely, so the bigger the sample, the more likely it is that you find a non-significant result, which is exactly opposite of what you'd expect if these are true effects, right? Because obviously, conditioning on the effect size not changing, the bigger your sample, um, the more power you're going to have. It would, but it's going to be really hard, I think, to find all those, you know, to find all those, those file drawer um, studies. But there, uh, there's a... Yeah, you know, there, so that, does, that actually happens too. I think there's going to be a publication bias against those as well. So th it's actually funny. If you actually read some of these, there's, a, there's one particular, there's a, there's a couple of examples, but there are some that actually report that it's consistent, and you go on and you look at the coding, and only by really digging in there, you realize it's actually the opposite direction. And Karg actually reported at least one of those that we found that the, re that the, that the evidence was opposite, but had been reported in the abstract as being consistent. Um, so in a study that I did with Laramie Duncan, um, we argue that these and other observations are, suggest a high false positive rate in, this, in the kind of gene by environment literature which is due to a publication bias, uh, improper correction for significance due to many unreported tests or p-hacking, um, improper statistical model, modeling, and I think this is really the, one of the biggest ones. And, and it's just the low prior, this is what I've already said, just the low prior probability that any particular polymorphism that you're going to guess at is actually relevant and interacts with the trait. So you can, if you can imagine, it's probably hard to pick out a, 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 a candidate main effect it's probably doubly hard to pick out one, a, a candidate that's going to interact with a particular moderator that you've chosen. And, and also the low statistical power. If you add all those up, it, it, it adds up to a very, uh, probably a very high false positive rate in the literature. 
And this is, was, uh, I think, a very uh, important study. This was by Culverhouse in 2017. It just kind of vindicated this because we were, th our paper was published right after the CARG paper was, and we um, took CARG to task. And I, I know uh, those authors, and I like them, but I, I disagreed strongly with the conclusions that they made. Um, uh, CARG said that we think this 5-HTT, the ca original CASPI finding was correct. Um, we said we don't think it is for these reasons. And um, Culverhouse has uh, done the hard work to figure I this out, and I think in a definitive way. So they um, got together basically everybody they could who had studied, who had collected data on depression, particular life stress events, and, um, and collected data on 5-HTTLPR. And they all agreed beforehand on what the model was going to be, how they were going to code things, what, what the transformation on the, on, the, on the Y variable is going to be. So they knew exactly what they were going to do. They were going to do like three or four different tests and try to cover all their bases. And they did that, and what turned out was absolutely nothing was there. There was no effect. And this is in a sample of 39,000 people, right? 39 times, you know, over 40 times bigger than the original study. So it should be more than adequately powered to detect the original reaction. If anything, the evidence for the interaction was in the opposite direction of the original report. This is the most famous canon gene by environment interaction study ever done. There have been tons of publications, uh, you know, following up on this and showing how interesting it is, and it turns out that there's just not a thing there. So it's just following the same pattern. And this, this whole kind of gene thing is kind of like whack-a-mole, because as soon as you hit one down, then it moves into something else. It's like uh, three-way interactions, or it's like, oh, well, you didn't account for this, or, or it's an end of phenotype. Or, and at some point, I just think as a field, we've got to say, look, let's just stop. You know, let's just stop. Uh, there's, there's, there's good ways to, to get at these genetic effects, and it's probably not looking at particular candidates. Yep. That's right. Yep. So when people say, well, polygenic sports, that's yeah. not there. Yeah. It's very complex to do that right. Yep. Do you think it will be also a good service to the field besides criticizing this to help put out there, like you guys are thinking about doing yeah. how to do polygenic sports? Yeah. Moving beyond just saying that's wrong, because I think many, many people are trying to do good science, but yeah. it's not easy, easily translatable. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. And I actually have as my next slide is maybe the ways forward. But um, I think, you know, to that, en to that end, I think step one is to, is to point out the problem. And, you know, in science, there's nothing wrong with doing that. You know, I mean, we, we, we should, this, this should be a battle for ideas. And, the, and the, the ultimate arbitrator should be, you know, the evidence. And, I, th and uh, I think there's nothing wrong with pointing out that the evidence for this is lacking. Um, so I think the first step is, to, is for people to recognize that there's a problem. I think the second step is to talk about how to do it right. All right, so finally, to get to your point, I, um, how do we do this correctly? I, I, that's, forget about that. So, um, <laughs> so, so, so uh, these are just some ideas. So like I said early in the talk, it's a lot easier to knock down a barn than to build one. And so I haven't spent a lot of my time thinking about how to do it correctly, so I admit that. But, you know, you, you, it's also not my job to be to do everything, right? I mean, it's, I think it's fine for one scientist to be the little person who's pissing people off, and it's fine for another scientist, maybe people who are smarter than me, to, to say, well, this is how to do it, you know? So um, anyway, so how to do it, how, this is just kind of my thoughts about how to do it correctly. So for one, uh, maybe conduct a quantitative G by E, so in other words, that the genetic variance is moderated by the environment, or a qualitative G by E on the aggregate effect of SNPs, as you had su suggested, using a polygenic risk score, a po polygenic score, PGS, or a G Rimmel, which I'll talk about a little bit tomorrow. Um, but if single variant qualitative G by E is really the interest, then um, first of all, I think don't choose candidates at all. Conduct a G Wiz study. These are really, this isn't rocket science at G Wiz. It's not that terribly tough. I think you just got to make sure that you're controlling for the covariates in the same way. I mean, no G Wiz would ever be published if people said we didn't control for a batch or for ancestry, right? Well, by the same token, you've got to control for batch correctly. In, a, in, in an interaction study, and you've got to control for ancestry correctly in a GWIS study. Um, uh, if you have to choose candidates, then um, choose them based on prior statistical evidence, not on historical precedent, I would argue. So maybe choose the top hits from a GWAS. 
as, a, as a, maybe a good place to start. Why? Because it's probably unlikely that these interactions are truly crossover interactions. There's often going to be some kind of marginal effect. And so why not go ahead and start with the biggest marginal effects from a GWAS as a, as a first place to look? You know, I think certainly choosing an APOE variant to, to look at interaction studies is perfectly great. There's a huge effect there that we, that we know is, is true and robust. So I mean, let's start looking at, for interaction effects at, for, at those types of variants. Uh, also, I think it's important that we pre-register our analyses and that we um, report all the analyses that we did in the supplement. I think that's absolutely crucial. You know, so, so part of this, you know, part of my anger about this is it's not just about, I'm going to save some of that for, let me, I won't, I won't go into that now. We're going to have a question and answer period and I can go into this, that in a second. Um, so, uh, so um, I think it's important, as I said, to report results from both an additive and multiplicative model and also to uh, center your G and E variables or at least describe what the zero points are so that people can then interpret what the significant uh, you know, main effect, simple effect was in your results. Well, it might have been significant for, as I said earlier, for predicted effect at birth or something that's outside the range of your data. Um, so in all cases, we need to recognize that power is lower for higher order tests and we need to choose our sample size accordingly. Um, you know, as I've talked about a lot in this, this talk, uh, Carefully think about scaling issues and the potential uh, choice of scale and model to influence your results that you see. And uh, control for covariates uh, correctly. And I'm not really sure how to do that correctly in a GRIML. This is something uh, that's not really decided. I'm not sure how to do that, but anyway. Um, okay, so with that, I think I'll uh, quit and uh, open up to any questions people have. Can I ask about your schizophrenia example again? Uh -huh. so it seems to me there are a bunch of binary traits, whether you, well you either have the trait of them or you don't. Um, maybe schizophrenia is one of them, but like having a kid, contracting malaria when you're traveling yeah. to Senegal, etc. Yeah. And the liability is a purely statistical thing that's totally uninteresting. It seems to me that in those cases, in your example, is a good one. Which example uh, is it that uh, you're looking schizophrenia at? Schizophrenia and uh, <coughs> the, the drug, the schizophrenia drug. Mm -hmm. But only the additive scale makes sense. Like, why would I care about the effect on some other other transform scale. Yeah, I think um, this is, yeah, I must have passed it there. Uh, so, so, I, so that's my, like, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you, like, do you think even those settings would make sense to report this, these the interactions on this other multiple scale that we don't really care about? At least it's not obvious to me why we really care about the thing. I guess um, it, you know, I guess it does, it depends on, it depends on how we, we want to think about the, what, you know, what, how the risk, you know, interacts together. I mean, if we're, if we're, th you know. Seems like it seems obvious that ultimately here what we care about is only schizophrenia. Suppose that it was depression instead, mm -hmm. and we actually think that there was just arbitrarily, like, uh, discretizing the trait by saying everyone loves symptoms, and we actually care about the latent variable. Mm -hmm. Then I can see the arguments for looking on other scales, and it's like the interaction term and the probit and, and, the, and the additive model give different conclusions you have to think hard about which is better. Right. You probably report both. It seems to me there are also cases where it's just unambiguously the case that the additive model makes the most, uh, the additive scale makes yeah. more sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of agree, but I, I think, you know, I, I think it, it must depend on just kind of what's really go un going on, underlying it with respect to how this, these risks combine. I mean, I, I guess it's possible that, you know, if you, get, if you get an interaction on the risk ratio scale, but you don't get it on the additive scale, <coughs> I don't think that means that there's no interaction. You know, I just think that there is, I think it, what it's saying is there is an interaction if the risks combine multiplicatively for schizophrenia, right? And I, I think that's not completely unreasonable to think, think of it that way. I mean, you can think of, you know, the risk, you know, increases this by 10% and, and the, the risk for this increases schizophrenia by 20%. The risk of them combined, right, increases them by the product of those 1.1, whatever I said, times 1.2 versus, you know, the sum of them. And if, if that's kind of biologically how schizophrenia is being developed, then maybe the multiplicative scale is the right way to, to think about it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think in general you just kind of want to be open and so that, so that readers can kind of take, take their own conclusions. I think in general that there's this, this problem in the literature of people kind of saying, oh, well, you know, the, the interaction disappeared when you change scales, therefore the interaction isn't true. You know, I, I took the arcs, the, the arc signs, you know, square root of the arc sign transformation and the, yeah. 
uh, you know, it's like, well, who thinks about things in an arc sine square root transformation? I mean, you know, so I, I don't doubt that that could make the interaction disappear. And that's actually a poor example to use because an arc sine transform actually does remove the mean variance relationship under a binomial distribution. So, so, that, so <laughs> it's probably the worst example I could have used. But, um, you know, I think... Yeah, what it seems like an odd criticism because sometimes more scales are just more, I guess some on one scale are just more natural than another. Exactly. And this is kind of how I feel. It's like, you know, I think the way to do it, the thing about these interactions is th think of the scale that, w that makes the most intuitive scale to interpret. The scale that makes the most, uh, that's the easiest to interpret. And then if there's an interaction on that scale, then interpret that interaction. You know, I think it's, it, people go to, sometimes people are kind of purist in this, will go to kind of extremes to, to transform the interaction away and then saying that this is a simpler model. Well, it's not a simpler model if the, if the transformation that you made makes it impossible for normal people to interpret what the outcome is. So, yeah. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah. I think it's rife. I think it's all, most fields this is uh, this way. I know the same kind of thing is going on in, in cancer research, and um, you know I do I look at psychiatric traits, so that's what I've focused on, and you've got to kind of limit it in some way. But I'd be surprised if it's not the same for most other traits that are looked at. I, I think the problem is just fundamentally the candidate approach, the candidate gene approach. Yeah, yeah, you know, I screwed up. So one, oh, are you talking about this? That should be point 0.4. Oh, uh, no. Okay, sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that right before the talk. You, men you mentioned that the head, you've dropped the heterozygous. Yeah. Is that why the, there's nothing summing to one there? Or, uh, there's this, probabilities on that. No, no, th these aren't going to sum to one. This is the, so, so this is the probability of, of not having schizophrenia sam samples. These could all be zero, oh, right? I yeah. No, okay. that's a good clarifying question there. Any other questions or comments? True confessions? <laughs> okay. So let's, let's take a break now for 15 minutes and then we'll do the, the uh, problem set discussion. And there's more, we can ask obviously more questions about this uh, during, during the discussion. So let's, let's continue in 15 minutes at 535. <laughs> okay, great.